the 1930s, one out of every four Texas women worked outside the home. Compared with women workers across the country, Texas women were paid lower wages, worked under worse conditions, and had less union representation. You know, going out to the field to work, to pick cotton, for 30 cents, 100 pounds. And then if the cotton wasn't any good at all, uh, there wasn't very much that you could earn. You couldn't earn uh, nothing to live on. They had bathroom facilities for about five, depending on the size of the shop, five or six people at a time, and with 400 employees. And you were told you couldn't go to the restroom, only at lunch hour and during a 15-minute break. These people were not people. They were just uh, nothing. Uh, they, they didn't care as much about the people that worked for them as they did the machines, because when a machine broke down, they had to hire it fixed. When you broke down, they just put somebody else in your place. The working and living conditions of women in Texas before World War II, and their struggles to improve their situation tonight on Alternative Views. <laughs> When I was a child <clears throat> growing up in Oklahoma, I remember back in the late 30s, occasionally men would come to the door and knock and say, mow your lawn for a cup of coffee. And it happened so frequently that I thought, well, that's just the way the world is. But of course, that was coming out of the Depression, supposedly coming out of the Depression. And I also remember my father talking about trying to work his way through college back in the late 20s and early 30s, in which they'd go out to a field to dig ditches. The company people would come out, throw out five shovels, and of the 30 or 40 men, whoever could fight to get a hold of the shovel, well, he'd get the job for the day. And at the end of the day, they'd have enough money to buy a, a can of beans and a glass of milk. Those were tough times. And tonight we're going to start the first of a series of two, spotlighting what it was like during the Depression, the labor struggles on a, from the Depression through and after World War II, as told by four women. The movie is called Talking Union, made by some Austinites, one of whom, Melissa Heald, is with us tonight. But before we see the movie, we're going to have a few news stories. And these news stories are sprinkled in from 1982, 86, and 1993. You can see what we looked like when we were young, Felder. Extra magazine for July and August has a, a column about how the media have been forcing Bill Clinton to the right, as if that were really all that difficult to do. They say the national media have been engaged in this and has been quite successful. This effort culminated in Clinton's uh, selection of Reagan mouthpiece David Gergen as his counselor and spin doctor, media person, and in the dumping of Justice Department nominee Lanny Guineer. The press really cheered this. Well, of course, Clinton campaigned as an agent of change, an outsider, a populist. He would reverse all the, these bad things that had happened during 12 years of the Republicans. but. Uh, old spineless George, the latest in a long line of invertebrate uh, Democratic candidates and presidents, is just like all the others of his lineage. 
but the establishment press won't say it, but Axer points out that if only white men had been able to vote during the last election, old George would still be president. Well, what did Clinton do after he took office? Well, his proposed taxes on the wealthy were timid, his military cuts were meager, and his job packages was really a joke, just terribly inadequate before he gave it up completely just about. And his steps for progressive campaign promises uh, like uh, gays in the military or uh, not appointing insiders and the White House, White House jobs, that brought heat. All these things brought heat from the media, and he dropped them, of course. Uh, Exer points out that day after day in May of 1983, the New York Times and other national media claimed, without offering any evidence at all, that Clinton had been elected as a centrist. That's what they wanted. But once he got in office, he had lurched to the left. And that's why he was uh, just floundering around so much. In fact, this uh, leftward lurch was mentioned so often it appeared to be a new dance craze. You know, let's go down to Washington, D.C. and do the leftward lurch. Hey. Well, with Gergen in and Guineer out, the mainstream media breathed a sigh of relief. And then the Newsweek, uh, Eleanor Clift said that, uh, and it seems to sum up the press, tor press corps attitude that, oh, Clinton's shift to the right has finally happened. And she urged him to have the backbone to make it stick. <laughs> Pathetic. In a recent article in The Progressive, it's the May issue, the editor, Erwin Noel, brought up some good points, kind of about things that the mainstream media hasn't been covering. He begins by talking about a story that was written in 1982 by a man named Sam Day. It was entitled, The Afrikaner Bomb. And the story revealed the successful testing of a South African nuclear bomb in 1979. Day, who was also the former editor of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, spent seven weeks in South Africa conducting research. News releases and copies of the progressive article flooded the market to reveal his well-documented findings, but they fell into a bottomless pit of media silence. The South African apartheid government's denials apparently held more credibility with the mainstream media than well-documenting findings and research. Well, in March of 1993, President F.W. de Klerk acknowledged that South Africa had indeed began building a nuclear arsenal in 1977. It made front page news everywhere as a startling new disclosure, but it wasn't. It was merely a long overdue confirmation of the alternative press's findings nearly ten and a half years earlier. In 1984, the Progressive also ran a cover story by Alan Nairn. It detailed the United States' role in the El Salvadoran death squads. Nairn, who spent five weeks investigating the story in Central America, detailed how, beginning in the 1960s, U.S.-led organizations killed thousands of peasants and suspected leftists, and how the Reagan administration continued to provide training, support, and intelligence to forces directly involved with these death squads. Nair named names and specifics of a U.S. Salvadoran government partnership in torture, murder, and other atrocities. Once again, news releases and copies of the magazine were sent out only to be greeted by a total blackout. The only way the story reached the mainstream media was by a full-page ad taken out by the progressive in the Washington Post. Well, in March of this year, the United Nations Truth Commission published its report on human rights abuses in El Salvador. And, of course, it confirmed the substance of Alan Nair's nine-year-old article. Fortunately, the UN Commission didn't have to purchase advertising space to reveal its findings. It made front-page news and evening newscasts everywhere, which only goes to prove if you live long enough, you can find out everything, or you can read the alternative press. <laughs> You know, we had all of those stories because we report on the alternative press. Alternative Views has had every one of these stories and presented to you over the years. And there was a great documentary which we presented uh, several years ago. I guess it must have been about 1979, uh, 1980, about 79, I guess it was, on which it documented just exactly how the United States and West Germany were involved in illegally giving information to 
the uh, not only information but also uh, various types of substances and technological know-how to the South African government so they could build the bomb. And uh, at the, uh, this documentary was so great, it had pictures of Jimmy Carter denying it, uh, that they had done anything to help them build the bomb. But what really triggered it, uh, the, it, the interest in it was that the Russians had told the Americans that, hey, our monitors have shown that uh, there's been a bomb a test that has been, a bomb has been exploded in the test site in South Africa. What do you have on it? And Americans said, no, nothing, 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 nothing. But in matter of fact, uh, th it was going on and everybody was denying it except the Turner Press and this documentary which we showed. Yeah. I have a little blurb here from the National Organization of Women which talks about the problems of elderly women trying to make ends meet. They say that the Social Security laws discriminate against and victimize women. Women are penalized by the wage gap when they retire just as they are when they are working. Because Social Security benefits are based on earnings, so because they receive less than men, they get less from Social Security. Women who are widowed before they're 60 years of age are not eligible to receive survivor's benefits. But the average age of a widow of, over the, when they first become uh, widows or is, is 56. Another uh, reason that the, of complaint by the uh, National Organization of Women is that women who are divorced or widowed and who re-enter the workforce do not qualify for disability coverage because they haven't worked for five of the last ten years. So they indicated that the average yearly income for women over 65 is $4,226 as compared to $7,342 for men. And there are 15 million American women, 65 and older, who are on Social Security today. Uh, this is from the February issue of uh, our own Texas Observer. We have uh, quite a brouhaha brewing down in Texas about drugs. Governor Mark, Mark White recently came out and said that all public employees should be tested to make sure that they're intoxicant free. Well, Roddy Stinson, this is in the Observer, they're noting this, but Roddy Stinson writing in the San Antonio Express News said this could lead to unemployment lines reaching beyond the Austin city limits. He said, quote, an intoxicant test at the state capitol after lunch on a slow day could wipe out most of the executive branch and at least half of the Texas legislature. You got it there, Rowdy. But, of course, Governor White's uh, on the train, and he's enjoying all the publicity. Uh, Dallas columnist Molly Ivins says, as, as she says, uh, Governor White was born second cousin to a weather vane, and he's not likely to leave that behind anytime soon. I have another... Uh, I wonder if he said that while he was uh, stirring his martini with his fingers. Yes, indeed. We'll have time for some more news stories later in the program. But now let's turn to the centerpiece of this Alternative Views, the first in our two-part series of presenting to you the documentary Talking Union, recorded in September 1982. Melissa Heald is with us tonight. Melissa, you're director of the People's History in Texas, Incorporated. Yeah. Before we talk about the movie, can you tell us briefly just what that is? I will. In 1975, a group of us, mostly teachers, men and women here in Austin, formed People's History in Texas in order to uh, qualify for uh, nonprofit funding status. We were interested in collecting materials that could be used in teaching on minority groups, women, uh, working people. And we started by doing a Women in Texas History calendar for 1976. In the process of the research for that, we came across two strikes in San Antonio and in Dallas in the 1930s the one in San Antonio of pecan shellers, the one in Dallas of garment workers. And we realized that there was a story there that had not been told, that participants in both those strikes were probably still alive. We were interested in oral history, although none of us had had much experience with it. And what we did was put together a proposal to the National Endowment for the Humanities Youth Grants Program. We were all under 30 at that time. and we were successful in getting a grant to collect uh, information, archival information, also to identify women 
who were still alive who might be uh, participants in an oral history project who would tell us their stories and again we, we had some luck we found about eight people who were willing to talk to us and got their stories on tape with the tape and the information we had collected we then went to the Texas Committee for the Humanities and said we're people's history in Texas we've had this initial grant to do most of the background work and we'd like now to make a, a videotape uh, film out of the material we've got and again we we're convinced we know that there's a story here and this is what it is and we we were successful again in getting a second grant before we see the film is there anything else the audience should know about how this came into being or it's important to, to understand that oral history is probably the most valuable tool we have in getting at the stories of ordinary people uh, men and women who uh, work for a living, uh, not people who get in the papers or are famous, that when we look at, at the lives of those kinds of people, um, we have to use a kind of different set of standards. These are people who were famous, uh, people who got elected, people who made a difference in the way that we usually think of making a difference. But in the organizing activities that these people participated in, they gained something that changed their lives in as fundamental a way as, you know, getting elected to city council or state legislature or whatever w would change the life of a powerful individual today. They gained a sense of self-worth and self-esteem that stayed with them the rest of their lives and you can see that in them when they're telling their story they may not have been successful in the long run although uh, the pecan shellers won an initial pay increase and uh, some of the other women talk about uh, improvements in working conditions that they did achieve hey 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 I got the In the 1930s, one out of every four Texas women worked outside the home. Compared with women workers across the country, Texas women were paid lower wages, worked under worse conditions, and had less union representation. Little is known of the history of Texas working women as a group. The women in this film will begin to tell the story. My father is from San Luis Potosí. My mother is from Nier y Noriega in Mexico. And uh, of course, I don't know how old they were when they got married, but my oldest sister was born in Monterey. And when she was about uh, eight weeks old, they crossed here to the United States. And that was in 1908. So in a way, we were migrants also. We migrated also. We uh, the first time that I remember going out of the city of San Antonio, we went to Michigan, and they were harvesting beets, sugar beets. Of course, I was very young. I wasn't doing that. That was in 1924, the first year, and the second year was 1925. And thereafter, we used to go out pick cotton. 
you know, going out to the field to work, to pick cotton for 30 cents, a hundred pounds. And then if the cotton wasn't any good at all, uh, there wasn't very much that you could earn. You couldn't earn uh, nothing to live on. In San Antonio, low-paid seasonal work such as pecan shelling compelled most Mexicanos to migrate as farm workers during the off-season. Entire families worked in the fields to supplement their income. Well, my grandfather was a Methodist minister, and I, at the time I was going to school, and just prior to going to work, I had the idea I would like to be a foreign missionary. And then, of course, I guess this became my missionary work at home. Uh, is the only... Uh, people have asked me that, and the only thing I could ever come up with was that this did take the place of that missionary work that at that time I thought I wanted to do. My daddy was a carpenter and a builder, and my mother uh, had passed the teacher's exam to teach school, but of course she got married and never did teach. So we just lived an ordinary life. I went to school there in Dallas, Sunset High School, Winnetka Elementary School, and then I went to work, Justin McCarty's. They ran an ad, and there was about a hundred of us showed up that morning because jobs were not that plentiful. So out of the hundred or so people that were standing around waiting, the floor lady did the uh, hiring, and she went through the crowd, and I wasn't aware of it at the time, but what she did was to go through and pick out all the younger people. She hired about 50, and the others were sent away. And so... Uh, we all went to work right that day. We didn't wait till the next day or anything. She just went through and with her finger pointed out you and you and you. Well, the, the depression was in the thir in 30, and uh, that was 29, so it was actually just prior to the depression. I mean, I didn't really see that much difference if, if it had any effect at all because wages were so low then that they couldn't have gone any lower. And I was thinking back the other day how far I could remember my mother working. It seems like, I don't know, since 1927, I believe she was shelling pecans at that time. I can recall her working there because I was still in school at the time. And then the three of us, three sisters, that we were going to school up until the time the depression set in. Then we just couldn't, we just couldn't afford to go any, to school anymore. The depression just came in and it seems like there was nothing else we could do but help work. It was a depressive situation. Very, oh, I don't, I don't even know how, I can't even describe it. It was sad. It was ugly, uh, because when you see people that are hungry and there is no place to go get food, or rather no money to buy it with, it's a very sit sad situation. And it's not like it was just uh, these neighbors or a few people. It was all over. Everybody was mostly on the same boat. The conditions were poor, naturally, very poor. Because when you get 50, 60 persons all in one place, you know, sitting side by side, really sitting and on wooden benches, you know, mind you, not chairs, wooden benches, makeshift benches, and being there for eight hours, maybe nine, 10 hours, 
a day, you know, it's a very bad situation. Of course, we had no sanitary conditions at all. No sanitary conditions, period. Some of the shops, there was more than one floor of machines. They were dirty, there was no fans, there was no ice water. The lint and dust just hung from the ceilings. It was really a, a sight to see. And very hot and dirty. They had bathroom facilities for about five, depending on the size of the shop, five or six people at a time. And with 400 employees, and you were told you couldn't go to the restroom only at lunch hour and during a 15-minute break. And it was utterly impossible for that many people to, to get in the restroom at that time. And uh, I remember one lady who couldn't wait and had an accident in her seat, and that really rile people, particularly me, who put the boss to a test about going in the restroom and waiting out to see if I would be fired for it. Mm -hmm. And what then you know exactly? I went in and uh, when the floor lady told me I couldn't go, I said, I am. And I said, you tell Mr. Adelsberg if he doesn't like it, he can come and get me. And she said, well, he'll fire you. And I said, well, that's what I want to see. And he said, uh, she said, well, you really want me to tell him this? And I said, yes, I do. And she said, all right. And she started to leave. And I said, Bessie, tell him if he sticks his head in the door, I'm going to hit him with his chair. So I went in and I stayed for a good 20 or 30 minutes. And when I walked out, he was waiting for me. And he wanted to know if I was trying to make a fool out of him. I said, no. You made the fool out of yourself when you passed the note around and said no one could go to the restroom. And I said, go up and look in under Mr. Sut Ms. Sutton's dr uh, chair. And I said, you'll know why I'm doing what I'm doing. And uh, he said, uh, well, I could fire you. I said, that's your privilege. That's what I want to see. But he didn't. They would pay uh, the whole, the heart, you know, the whole pecan. You, they would pay better than the piece. Piece was cheaper. Okay, the best I can remember was being five cents a pound. And from there it went down. And I mean all the way down. To the point where some people were not getting paid with money anymore, but with beans and potatoes and staples, you know, rice, uh, shortening, salt, baking powder, coffee. And I don't mean that there was a whole bunch of it, you know, just a pound of this and a pound of that, maybe five pounds of beans, a sack of flour, 25 pounds sack of flour, maybe 10 pounds sack of flour, whichever they felt like giving you. We never, we never, my mother never allowed that though. Oh no, she fought for her money. If it was a dollar, she was gonna fight for it and you were, she was, she was gonna get it. The largest pecan shelling factory in San Antonio mechanized in the mid-1920s, but the machines were soon scrapped because it was cheaper to hire Mexicanos. By the 1930s, the 10 to 12,000 Mexicanos working in the industry shelled a quarter of the nation's pecan crop. Eighty percent of these workers were women. Whole families used to go in there. Not uh, just one person or two. But whole families used to sit there and work together. They would sort of put like little boxes, you know, divide them in little boxes. So everybody had a little, a little box, but one long table. You had to clean it, you had to shell it, and then you would have to go over it several times so there wouldn't be any shells in it. And even the, even the peas, you know, the little pieces, you would have to take every bit of that shell out of there so that uh, it won't have any. So at the time that you, at the evening or whatever time you were getting ready to leave, then you would have to go out to the front where the man was, and they would weigh these pecans, you know, see how many pounds you have shelled for the day. 
and then they would or inspect it, sort of inspect it. And if you have any shells left in it, they would give it back to you and you had to go and do it all over again. Two or three times, as many times as they, until there was not a single shell left in it. These people were not people. They were just uh, nothing. Uh, they, they didn't care as much about the people that were farmed as they did the machines because when a machine broke down, they had to hire it fixed. When you broke down, they just put somebody else in your place. There was no loyalty, no care. Uh, it just didn't matter if you got hurt in the shop. I ran a needle in my finger and uh, it broke off and thread hanging from the top side and the bottom side. And it took me about an hour and a half to see a doctor and get the needle out. Uh, but, but they didn't care about that. You lost this all on your own time. Uh, they, they really thought you were less than human. Responding to the crisis of the Depression and workers' demands, Congress passed the National Recovery Act in 1933. Although the NRA established minimum wages in many industries, management often devised ways of violating the spirit of the law, and in doing so, provoked increased union activity. The NRA went in, and you were supposed to work X number of weeks, and I still have looked that up and I forgot for nine dollars a week and then you were supposed to get twelve dollars a week while well, management would work you eight weeks lay you off and rehire you as a new worker you never got past that nine week period to get the twelve dollars a week and I know uh, Justin McCarty had his nephew working in the sales department I believe he was not in the factory as such a bookkeeping department I guess and uh, he was so provoked at Justin McCarty that he lost his job with a remark he made to him. He said, why don't you just go ahead and pay these people the $12 and stand down to the stairs and take it away from them when they go out. It'll save a lot of bookkeeping. And he lost his job over this. <laughs> so I presume that this would be one of the big things that really brought things to a final showdown. Magdaleno Rodriguez, he started trying to organize the people, and he had a very big following. I remember my mother used to be involved in that. What he did was he organized the people, I'm assuming, all over the west side. And then uh, he formed committees, and each committee had their elective, re elective representatives. He had a president, vice president, uh, secretary, and treasurer. And my mother got to be vice president of one of them. My mother was a, a very, very active person, more so than my father. It seems to me like she was always ahead of everything and getting involved in things. But my father was seemed to always be there in the background, you know, not shying away from the problem, but uh, just uh, supporting her, in other words. So. That is one of the reasons that I believe we really got involved, because we were always right behind Mama. We were hungry, and there was no pl no place to to go get a job. So the wages were so low that we had no other recourse but to go and strike. Well, the only thing I can remember is that all of a sudden there was a strike and. Everybody was out in the street picketing every single place where they used to shell pecans.
it, it really was bad inside when the strike was called. Uh, the boss, with all of his pressure, and of course, needless to say, we were saying, we got to do this. And we were putting our pressure on, too, that we got a chance to do something, let's do it. So we'll lose a few weeks' work, but we'll make it up in the long run. Well, those of us who were real active uh, went down 6.30 that morning with our handbills with the general strike call. And I think a good many people even uh, didn't know that they stood around in groups outside that they really didn't know whether to go in or stay out. They wanted to be with the union. And they were afraid because they'd been told they'd never spend another day in a shop in Dallas. And that was their home. And they, they were just frightened and hungry. Cops. We had more cops around the shops than we had pickets. And, of course, the cops were given liquor. And we know this for a fact. We saw it. They were, I'm sure, given extra checks to come out and... Uh, they, too, cursed the people and said ugly things and even used their belly clubs on people, hauled us to jail. Uh, the, the, I guess the fight was bigger with the cops than it was even with management. The same companies who wouldn't pay a decent salary would haul the scabs to work in cabs, and I'm positive that a good many of those people had never been in a cab before in their life. It was a big deal. But they'd bring them in in cabs. Then the cops would line up shoulder to shoulder or hold hands and make a, an aisle for the cabs. They'd be lined up for blocks, and they'd run them through like cattle. People were just lined up all over. Police would come and pick up when they started putting us in jail, you know, then they would start just get people by the bunches, you know, not one or two or three, just carry them off in the van and just put us in jail. They just they used to take literally hundreds of people who were in jail. Now, I might be exaggerating, but I used to remember that people would say that the jails were so full of people that there was just no more place to put them in there. And we were because I spent about 24 hours in there, and, uh, and there were a lot of people in there. Of course, I never knew what a jail looked like inside, and I haven't been back in one yet either. But uh, they were just people, you know, with standing room. Standing room only. Lester Larch, who was a spokesman for the Manufacturers Association, called and said that if we would call off the pickets, during market week that they would meet with us to try to come to an agreement. Well, we knew he was not sincere. We knew he was lying the way he'd always done. But we couldn't afford not to say that we cooperated. So we called off the pickets for the week. And when Mr. Pearlstein called him for an appointment, he told him to go to hell. So we had a mass picket line around his shop that morning. In other words, instead of distributing the pickets around the five or six shops, we concentrated on Lester Larch's shop. And quite by accident, uh, the police actually caused it, but all of a sudden, one of the scabs was left without any clothes on. <laughs> and the police were having a ball. But uh, we got international publicity on the so-called stripping party because once things got started on both sides, there was a lot of people left without clothes that morning. And Lester Larch went upstairs. He made a line of uniforms. Uh, nurses, I think they were nurses' uniforms. or They were white. They could have been restaurant uniforms. But anyway, they were a uniform. And he brought stacks and stacks of them down. And he'd stand inside the door and wrap them up in a uniform when they'd finally get in the door. And then I understand, uh, I can't swear this to my own knowledge, but I understand he made them pay for those uniforms <laughs> after they'd lost their own clothes 
trying to do get into his shop. But we'd, we'd tell Lester Larch if he'd come out and face us, we'd leave his people alone. But he never would come out the door. He later told one of our manufacturers in St. Louis that he'd rather 50 men would get a hold of him than those four women. <laughs> so I think that the more the police harassed the people, the more they came out. You know, like when you run into an ant pile and you s scatter them like that, and they start coming out. You make them angry, <laughs> and they're going to sting the heck out of you <laughs> if you don't get away. I feel that's the way we were. The more they harassed the people, you know, the, the worse the people just kept on coming from nowhere, from everywhere. That's, that's the way I see it now, the way, the way I remember it. Even if we were afraid, which I'm sure we were, which I'm sure we were afraid, because at that time, people were really afraid of police. They were really afraid of being in jail. But like I say, the worst it got, the worst they harassed the people, the people just started coming in fear or no fear, they were there. They'd thrown us all in jail. They'd throw in everybody on the picket lines. And then we were told to appear in court and show cause. And we were real surprised. There was about 125 of us who'd been in jail. And when we got into Judge Town Young's court, uh, the first thing he did before there was any hearings or anything was to say that he had a, some paper on a desk in front of his uh, bench and that anyone who would sign that paper not to go on the picket line anymore, they could go home and they wouldn't be tried. Well, we'd had no way to be prepared for this because nobody had ever heard of such a thing before. And, of course, immediately, we kept hoping that he would call one of us. We knew that there would be some few who would do what the first person did because they hadn't had time to discuss such a move or anything, and they wouldn't know whether anybody else was going to follow suit or not. And if you didn't sign this paper, you had to go to jail for three days and nights. Well, the first person they called was a little lady that Nobody would have even been hurt if she had signed it. She had three little children at home and a sick husband. And if anyone needed to sign that paper and go home, she did. She also was a woman who had never participated in any of the activities on the picket line other than to do her picket duty. She was a quiet person who sort of stayed alone. We didn't know that much about her. She was faithful. And when they called Rachel's name, some of us, uh, I know my heart just hit the floor. I thought, well, that will cause several others to sign, because she did. And there was no doubt in my mind but what she would sign, because she needed to sign and go home. But what she did, she walked up and stood in front of that paper and said, huh, and if you were going home, you were to walk out the door. If you were to, wouldn't sign, you were to go in the judge's chambers behind the court. And she looked and she said, huh, and walked right on in all by herself. And as a result, not one single person signed that paper. What's that I hear yonder coming? coming, coming What's that I hear yonder coming? Yonder coming. What's that I hear? Well, get on board, get on board. Well, it's that union train coming. It's that union train coming. It's that union train coming. Well, get on board, get on board. And it has saved many a thousand. It has Get 
This is the first half of Talking Union. The last half hour will be presented next week when we will talk about the labor struggles of women in Texas during World War II. And now we will return to our interview with Melissa Heald, who will tell us more about the documentary Talking Union. The film was completed in the spring of 79 and premiered here in Austin to a very wildly enthusiastic audience of about 200 people. We then took the film on a tour of six other cities in the state and again were warmly received. Uh, we put together public programs in, in each city, uh, usually a, an historian uh, who knew something about either women's work or labor, um, possibly someone currently active in organizing unions uh, that varied from place to place and audiences varied as well. Uh, after that we were successful in getting the University of Texas Film Library to take on the film and distribute it for us and now it is largely seen on campuses uh, not very often in schools but has been seen I would say very fairly uh, widely throughout Texas I run into people who say oh I've heard of Talking Union uh, frankly you know we're an independent group um, none of us are professional filmmakers because we don't have, you know, sort of professional kind of label that's a, you know, identifiable with us, we've had some trouble getting national distribution. We keep trying, though. Um, every once in a while, a new distributor of independent work will emerge, and we'll we'll contact them. Um, I believe in Talking Union. I believe in the work that that we in People's History in Texas is doing. Uh, there's an audience for it, and. My feeling is that, um, you know, its day will come. Thank you. Let's return to the days of yesteryear for some more news stories. Talking about labor, there's a big push for the AFL-CIO down in Houston. This comes from another local Austin newspaper, Noticias, and it says that the 1970s brought 700,000 new workers into Houston and now they're trying to unionize them, which is a tough job in Texas because it's a so-called right-to-work state. But they're finding already they've had pretty good response. They've added 2,000 new people since uh, January 1st, including two, uh, 350 teachers. And of course management is coming in with two tactics. First they raise wages and then they come in with a consulting firm to try to break up the union before it gets started or if it does get a toehold to try to bust it up. One of the main problems with Texas is the safety. The safety is sadly lacking in Texas. It has one of the highest accident rates in the, in the country, I believe. The wages are low. There is no job uh, security. People can be uh, in, um, working for a long time and goodbye, and that's it. So workers are beginning to look at unions again. At least in Houston, they're pouring a lot, a lot of money in there. I believe I saw an article the other day that said Texas trails only the Carolinas in, in the lowest wage category. Mm -hmm. And yet somebody was telling me they heard a call-in program on a radio in which the head of the Texas AFCIO was on it, and they were extremely hostile to him and unions in general. It's a contradiction. <clears throat> Even though polls and research have shown that overall union, if you belong to a union, you're going to have higher wages than if you're not in the union. I have a story about what workers are doing in some parts of the country to stop the plant closures that are happening as more and more companies go bankrupt or more and more big corporations want to close down different plants that they own in different parts of the country. More and more workers are starting to take over these firms. There's an article in American Business that Mike Jankowski gave me that points out that in recent months, employers have bought out the owners of several large and prestigious firms, including Milwaukee-based Harley-Davidson Division and General Motors Roller Bearings Plant in Clark, New Jersey. In fact, before long, 11,500 employees of National Steel Corporation's Wyerton, West Virginia plant are also going to take over the plant. This is the largest plant and the biggest employer in the state of West Virginia, the, the workers are going to start taking over their um, firms. 
Now, this has happened in the past in small firms where often the small business owner sold out to the workers who managed it uh, cooperatively, cooperatively, but never before have industries of such a major import, such as this automobile, steel, and even the airline industries have been taken over recently by workers. Continental Airline, a group of uh, high-salaried uh, pilots got their money together to buy Continental Airlines when they feared that they might lose their job and the airline might go over when the company was about to be sold by to a corporation called Texas Air Corporation. And the pilots and some of the employees themselves took it over, according to this uh, article, which I hadn't heard uh, before. They claim that this is a very good policy because the problems with American business, one of the major sources of the problems, has been poor management. And when the workers take it over and they own the factory, they have much more incentive to do a good job of managing. And because the workers often know more about production and what's actually going on in the plant than managers, they're in a better position to make uh, decisions. Moreover, the other problem with American industry in recent years has been poor attitude and low morale on the part of workers, so it's claimed. Whereas when the workers own their plants, their morale is much better, they tend to work harder, they're more productive, so that this seems to be a good idea that more and more American workers are starting to think about when they're faced with plant closure, they get money together and uh, take over the plant. In fact, in the media, this happened, I think, 30 or 40 years ago, the Milwaukee Journal, if I'm not mistaken, had a very progressive owner. When he died, he willed, or he said that it couldn't be sold to anybody but the people who worked there. And they're regularly voted, the Milwaukee Journal is voted among the 10 best newspapers in the country. There's an article in The Nation on January the 11th of this year that states that winds of change are blowing in big labor. This was a report on the AFL-CIO convention, and it indicated that labor in the United States was striking out new directions and was changing some of their previous policies and or organizing tactics in what the writer of this article, Harold Meyerson, thought was a progressive direction. He began his story by pointing out that Ken Blaylock, who is the president of the American Federation of Government Employees, stepped up to the mic in one dramatic moment to speak out in favor of a federation amended resolution on Central America, the first progressive resolution that American labor on the highest level had ever passed on Central America or U.S. foreign policy. Blaylock had been to El Salvador and stated that he'd seen miles of homes destroyed. He then said, it makes you wonder what our government is all about. I look at Iran, South Vietnam, Nicaragua, El Salvador. Just once, he said, I would love my government to be on the side of the people, not on the side of rich dictators living behind high walls. This was significant, according to Meyerson, because it was the first time they'd ever had a debate, an open debate, in the AFL-CIO High Councils on American foreign policy, and is the first time that they'd ever pr passed progressive foreign policy resolutions at this level. Moreover, this was just part of a sweeping organizational change that Meyerson said was beginning to take place within the union movement in the United States. He says that this change is finally coming to the American labor movement because in recent years, the magnitude of the disasters that are confronting it and the inadequacy of their past responses are becoming clearer and clearer to more people within the union movement. Chronically high unemployment, a globalized labor market, sectoral and sectional shifts in the workforce, an administration that is definitely anti-labor and attempting to bust unions, and the fact that the non-agricultural workforce is at a post-war low of 18.8 percent union membership. All of these facts have forced the union movement to reappraise some of their past strategies. Talking about the terrible things that occur down in Central America, all of these policies that have been a result that have resulted in this have been helped out by the AFL-CIO's organization, uh, the uh, American Institute for Free Labor Development, which has worked hand in glove with the CIA for many years, just to 
maintain these uh, corrupt, brutal dictatorships and to keep down the progressive unions and the workers' organizations that have been in Central and Latin America. Well, th this article has a detailed history on AFL-CIO foreign policy since World War II and makes precisely this point. But evidently, in the last few years, the unions have been sending observer teams down to Central America and have been appalled at U.S. policy in that region and also have strongly objected to the fact that people in the AFL-CIO hierarchy have not adequately supported the unions in that region and that this has had a detrimental effect on the working class movement in that region. Plus, the reactionary foreign policy of the union movement has cut off the union movement from more progressive segments of American society, and the more far-seen union leaders want to make connections mm -hmm. with those segments and are th thus trying to modify their foreign policy uh, views. The Food and Drug Administration, it's a kind of a good news, bad news type thing. The good news is that the Food and Drug Administration has proposed banning the use of a carcinogen called methylene chloride in hair sprays because laboratory tests indicate that uh, it's caused cancer in animals. Well, now's the bad news. The FDA has refused to ban the use of the same carcinogen in decaffeinated coffee. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for watching Alternative Views this evening. We'd like to thank Melissa Heald and Jim Cullors from the People's History in Texas and Austin Community Television, ACTV. For our news section, our camera person was Eric Eubank and audio man Kevin West. Our interview, our director was Alan Bouchong, camera people Rob Donald and Mark Negretti. Good night.